Jamal Chandler from Chase D Trade to take us through stock market basics, helping traders navigate the equity roadways. Uh, Jamal, it is all you. Well, thank you, Todd. I appreciate it. And trust me, I'm you're fine on time. I, I know how to be <laughs> brief. Um, hello, everyone. Thanks for joining today. Glad to have you all here. I know um, many of you have probably been interested in trading and learning how to trade for some time and have many thoughts and ideas and so many questions and, and where to begin. And then you see a day like the last two days and you're like, wow, I'm really interested now or, or you're probably already in or, you know, I'm, I'm sure that you're exactly at the moment where I need to reach you. Um, just so you know a little bit about me. I've been in the field for 15 years. I worked at an options trading firm. Some of you maybe know what options are. Um, some of you don't, and that's fine. Options have had quite a moment in the past couple of years, particularly because of the pandemic. Um, but they are different ways of playing the stock market, to be honest with you. And a lot of people like to say, well, you know, a stock market is gambling and options are gambling. Completely false, in my opinion. I think it's more financial engineering, um, particularly when you learn how to use these tools and use them in the right way. Nevertheless, that's where I learned. I learned at an options trading firm. I worked there for eight years, spent some time trading on my own. I eventually came back into business through the regulatory route, meaning work at that FINRA, which is very odd for somebody who worked in the trading field to eventually go work at the regulator. Uh, they don't always necessarily earn all on the same page, but honestly, it was a great experience because I learned another part of this business, which is vast. And uh, eventually I worked at an exchange, which is another part of the business. And now I'm in financial media and I feel equipped enough to talk about many of the things in, in uh, financial media. And I work for Tasty Trade, as, as Todd told you, which is a financial media network, but largely we focus on options. Now I tell you all that to say, um, it means nothing. Why? Because that's not where I started. And that's why this is cool for you to hear because I, completely started in a very different field. I went to school for chemistry. I did chemistry undergrad at a small school in Atlanta, uh, Clark Atlanta University, and then I went straight to graduate school right after. So uh, I did a uh, master's in material science and engineering at the University of Wisconsin. And I don't tell you all these things just so you think, oh, wow, this guy is, is smart. I hope not, I'm just average guy. <laughs> I tell you all that because I always, I think people find it fascinating to know that I'm not somebody who's been in the financial business for 15 or 20 years. I, I, I picked it up, I learned it, and a lot of you can do the same. Um, and that's why it's important. That's why we're discussing this type of stuff today. And so, you know, I had a 10 year career in, in science and engineering, and that's what I was working in. And honestly, along the way, traveling back and forth to see family, I'm from Wisconsin back to you know, North Carolina visiting my mom, Plenty of times I take the plane and I, I, you know, just read fluff, right? Back when we actually picked up magazines at those stores in the airport, right? <laughs> I'm sure we all use our phones now, but back in the day I was, you know, picking up a magazine here and there and just reading. Honestly, I was reading stuff to get the the research and whatnot off my mind, you know, just simple stuff. But eventually, you know, this was around the time period where they were talking about Social Security as as we knew it and existed was probably not going to be as much of a thing anymore in retirement. You know, 401ks were beginning to really emerge and people were talking about trying to find ways to make sure they had enough money for their retirement and for, um, you know, whatever they want to do with, for the rest of their life. And I realized that after all this science that I had been taking for the previous, you know, 15, 20 years, I didn't know a thing really about finance. I mean, sure, I took that, you know, business course that you take in high school, or whatever. And but for me in college, you just they don't. When you're in science and engineering or in certain other fields, right, you don't have the time to take electives like that and learn. And, you know, I got to tell you, knowledge was for this particular type of field was very hard to come by once upon a time. So I started to pick up different books and different magazines and learn the basic stuff because the jargon is really where it starts in any field. And I knew that from my science career. Jargon, if you don't understand the jargon, if you don't know what an Erlenmeyer flask is in chemistry, then how are you going to do a chemistry experiment? And so that's kind of my thought process. So I started to learn the jargon. And I think that's one of the bigger things. And honestly, when I eventually, you know, I eventually took a job in the field because I wanted to, not because I had to. 
but I, of course, I, I learned a lot more and that was always my, my thought process. How much can I learn? I didn't go to that trading firm to make money, honestly. I mean, sure, that was part of my job, but I went there to really learn because I figured if you learn, eventually you learn how to make money. And so that's really what my hope is for you guys today when we go through some of this basic stuff is understanding the jargon, right? Because truth is these days, you are probably the best person to understand how you want to make money and um, how much money do you want to have and how you can do it. And we all want to make money, right? But you all have to understand it does come with losing sometime, from time to time. And so the goal is to minimize the amount of losses. And how do you do that? You do that with education. You do that with understanding. So with that being said, let's move forward ahead um, because I wanted to give you guys sort of a background and understanding of where what the point of understanding the, the basics are and what the, the point of understanding the knowledge and the jargon in the field and so this is going to be very basic overview today um moving ahead of course our disclaimer slide which is always important as i'll leave this up for a second but it's always important to understand the basics in the backgrounds you know simple things like um when you're looking at a stock and you see the numbers when you're deciding to buy it how do you decide to buy how do you decide to sell you know it can be as simple as that you can move on, of course, eventually to what you decide to buy and what you decide to sell. And if you've already been reading some stuff and, and learning in the field, I'm sure some of you, you know, read a lot of the media. <laughs> and I say that with a chuckle because there's so many, you have to understand at times that many in the media are incentivized to sort of, um, you know, write certain things like, oh, because of inflation, it's a good time to buy gold. Now, I mean, the, the, that that's not completely untrue, but at the same time, there's a lot of different things that comprise those type of ideas. And so, and some of them are 50 year old ideas, right? So you don't necessarily want to make make decisions just based on something that you read uh, here and, you know, here and there and, and anywhere else. You always want to make sure you understand what their ideas are behind these decisions. So starting very basic, the stock market is made up of exchanges. You know, I'm sure you've heard of the New York Stock Exchange, which of course is a huge stock exchange in New York. And then of course you've heard of probably, maybe you've heard of the NASDAQ Exchange. Um, the NASDAQ is, you know, the New York Stock Exchange is very broad based. There's a lot of different uh, stocks that trade on it many times. And this used to be the case. I'm not, it's not 100% of the case now, but many of the names that trade on NASDAQ, uh, I mean, I'm sorry, in New York Stock Exchange usually have three letters in their stock ticker. And many that trade on the NASDAQ are usually more tech focused and they have usually typically four letters in their stock ticker. So um, that's kind of one way to distinguish what's trading on the New York Stock Exchange or the NASDAQ. Now, truthfully, it doesn't really matter for you too much to know, oh, if I'm gonna trade on the NASDAQ or the New York Stock Exchange. Maybe later in your career when you get more interested, you can find out somewhat of a difference versus what trades where and why. But um, just as a base level, you should understand so usually if something's trading on the New York Stock Exchange, it has high volume, which is important, by the way. When you want to trade something that has high volume, it's very liquid. Um, usually something that's very liquid and has high volume and has a better standard of trading. And it's not uh, subject to, uh, you know, the type of deal, the type of things you in, end up dealing with with very illiquid stocks. So very simply. You probably heard of bull or bear uh, traders. Who are who's a bull and who's a bear when it comes to the stock market? This is just simply the idea of understanding who is interested in getting long of the stock and taking a long position, and those who want to get short, if you will. So a bull wants to take a long position and benefit from the rise in the stock price, right? So that's why you know the stock market is bullish. It's going up, it's bullish, right? Right now, of course, you've probably heard about bearish more than anything because the stock market has by and large been going down over the last three weeks or so as we started the year and typically of course that comes along with a little bit of fear because well markets are supposed to only go up right they're not supposed to go down so the bear idea comes from the fact that um it's doing the opposite you somebody wants to take a sh short position or they they want to profit from the stock market and or any any given stock going down okay so those are very simple. Maybe some of you have heard of those, maybe not, but it's important to understand that. This is a, a very straightforward idea. So if you want to, um, you know, kind of buy a stock, one of the things you typically do when you pull it up, 
um, you see a stock, you see the numbers probably moving, always pay attention to the bid and the ask, okay? So when you're, if you see that, the bid is usually on the left side, right? If you see the two numbers, you see the stock moving, it'll show you um, the prices for the stock. You know, say for example, I'm not even sure what the stock is trading right now, but let's just say Apple, right? And stock is trading a hundred and well, you know what we can get. I, you know, I, I, for years I would work and we would give static numbers. I like to give real time numbers because I feel like real time numbers and real time understanding is uh, helps you a lot more, right? So you can pull up Apple right now. I'm sure you guys have it in front of you. You can pull up on your screen and pull up wherever you want. Right now, you'll see the last price is probably moving fairly fast because, well, we're in a market that's moving fairly fast, but also it's Apple, it's very liquid. But you'll see about 158, 82, 158, 81, 85, right? You'll see that's the last. And then you'll see sell and buy. That's the bid and ask. And so if you wanted to sell Apple short right now, meaning you don't have a position, you would hit the sell. That's hit the bid. That's 158.80. If you wanted to buy it, that's getting long. That's taking a bullish position. That's right now you'd be paying 158.85. So understanding what a bull and a bear is and understanding how to um, you know, hit the bid as we call it, meaning sell. Now you can sell short or you can also if you're if you have a long position already and you purchased Apple and you'd have a bear position and then say you made money on it and then you want to sell out that long position, that's also another way to sell. Now that's not going short, that's just selling your long position. And that's another thing I think that can confuse people from time to time. So if you're selling long, that means you're closing out a long stock position that you already had and now you have no position. Or if you are selling short, that means you don't have a position and you're getting short a position and want to just profit on the stock falling, okay? So in general, I think this is one of the more important things to understand when you're trading. And this is something that people mess up all the time and it doesn't matter if they're new or if they've been in the field. The idea of putting on a position too big. Many of you right now might be seeing stock prices much lower than you saw them three weeks ago or maybe even six months ago. And you're like, now is the time to get in. But I think it's important to stay small. Um, and this is a big mantra that we have on our Tasty Trade Network, the idea of trading small. Um, and now with options, it's a little bit different. We say trade small, trade often, but that's for a, a different type of trading. In this regard, when you guys are starting out learning to stock or maybe even considering you know, long-term investing, you still wanna keep your trade small. You don't wanna go all in with all the money you have, right? If you have $100 to trade, you don't want to trade all of your hundred. You might want to trade half. I know that sounds odd. You're like, well, how much can I buy with half? Well, that's part of the thing, right? Because the other part of all of this is learning the ecosystem of managing your money in general, whether it's trading, whether it's life. Honestly, a lot of the same principles in trading can go to life. You don't want to go all in with your chips right away. You have to be small and you want to try to be diverse as you can. Now, does that mean try to buy, you know, 100 stocks that are worth $1 with your you know, $100, or even if you have, you know, if you're doing like I just said and you're only using half, does that mean you wanna buy 50 stocks worth a dollar with your $1? No, because then you're too diverse, right? And so there's a method to the madness, but you do have to be small and you do have to be diverse because you wanna avoid large P&L swings and that's profit and loss. So that's another, um, you know, a term for you to understand. When you see P&L, that's just profit and loss, right? You want to avoid large profit and loss swings in your portfolio. And that's what you can do by being small and diversifying your trade to some degree. So diversifying means, you know, even if you buy Apple and you buy Microsoft, well, you might not necessarily want to buy Amazon too, because they're all in the NASDAQ, which we're going to talk about a little bit. They're all in these same areas and they all get affected by the same type of thing. So important to have this idea of, well, maybe I'll buy one tech stock and maybe I'll buy a healthcare stock and maybe I'll buy a financial stock, right? And then I just have three and I still have some money on the side to be able to withstand any big drawdowns that may come along because you just never know when that happens. It, nobody whispers in your ear and tells you when a big drawdown happens. It happens overnight and it happens fast. It's just what I've seen in the, in the 15 years I've been in the market. And then finally, benchmarks. And this is what we're about to get into a little bit. The idea of Invest uh, using you use benchmarks to sort of um, get an idea of 
you know, base your portfolio on how the rest of the world is doing as far as a benchmark. So perfect example of a benchmark is the S&P 500, which we'll talk about in a second. It is a broad-based index. And so a lot of people will use that benchmark to get an idea of how their specific portfolio was trading because, well, they can't trade the S&P 500 in its purest form, which we'll discuss in a second. But what I want you to understand here is a benchmark is a way to measure your performance, your portfolio performance um, to a broad-based performance overall. And so it's possible to invest in these in a myriad of ways. And, oh, there we go. So the first benchmark I want to bring to your attention, um, for those who have not heard of before, is the S&P 500. The S&P 500 is an index, first and foremost, and you'll see it quoted a lot of times. You watch the news, you hear about the performance of the Dow, the NASDAQ, and the S&P on any given one day. Now, why did I start with the S&P? Why didn't I start with the Dow? Well, the Dow is important. Um, the Dow does have, of course, 30 stocks. It's, uh, it's, it's diversified as much as you can be for 30 stocks, right? But at the end of the day, it's a relatively, it's, it's, you know, the oldest and it's probably the least relevant with regard to the market today. And then let me explain what I mean by that. See, the S&P 500 has 500, really 505, actually. We, can, we say the S&P 500, but it's, that actually has 505 different stocks in it. And it has it across a multitude of indices, as you can see right here, uh, industries, as you can see right here. So we have Infotech industry, which is largely tech names, right? We have healthcare, which is 13%. We have consumer discretionary, which I always describe as, you know, the things that um, you need but not necessarily want. Consumer discretionary includes like cars and just things like that. That uh, well, you could you could argue sometimes if you need a car, but do you really? Especially in this time and day, um, depending on where you live, I suppose. You know, if you live in an area where your transportation is not as readily available, uh, unlike how uh, Todd and I live in Chicago, it's a little bit different. But um, the truth is like the idea of just consumer discretionary just refers to stocks that are things that you know people kind of just want to have but don't necessarily need right then you have financials of course which include many of the financial companies uh, banks if you will um you have consumer services which by and large includes a lot of the companies that with regard to like verizon and um you know, at&t but also uh, a new type of in uh, new type of ways of communicating like Twitter and financial media sometimes. You also have industrials, which are a time-honored uh, division. You can see that's a little bit smaller. Once upon a time, you could look at this thing several years and it has the, com the composition of this has changed throughout time. Uh, of course, Infotech has large, uh, a lot of the large cap tech names and those have dominated the market and they have grown. And as a result, this has grown. A lot of people have argued that maybe this, uh, you know, this distribution of industries needs a redo because many of these large tech names have carried the market as we've talked about and as you've seen. Nevertheless, you have consumer staples, which are the things you actually need, right? Those are food and, you know, things like that. And, and then you have energy, which was a lot bigger in this pie once upon a time, but energy changed over the last, uh, what, 10, 12 years since we had the financial crisis. And then you have real estate, and then you have materials, and then you have utilities. And so these are the top 10 holdings on the right here, as I was referring to. Apple, of course, is, is, is the largest within these holdings. And then you have, um, you know, oh, this is another thing. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm just sprouting them off as if you should know. But these are some of the tickers. So these are some of the tickers that we look at. And this is one of the things that I think will help eventually uh, sort of accelerate your learning in the field is learning some basic tickers and apple is about as basic as it gets we all um i'm gonna assume on here that we all know apple even though i'm a samsung guy i'm i'm staying that way for the time being the only thing that might make me change and i've been considering it but as far as phones i've been considering maybe going to apple because it's probably the only way my kids will actually talk to me because then they can facetime me right and so that's actually one of the only reasons other than that i'm samsung all the way that's neither here nor there we have Microsoft, which of course many of you know as well, MSFT, um, Tesla, TSLA, it's the largest car company now um, in the world. And so it's definitely something that you should be aware of and should know. And it's actually one of the more newer entrants in the S&P 500 index. Then we have Google. Um, 
I'm going to bring it up anyway. I don't want to confuse you, but I will bring it up anyway because Google actually has two tickers, if you'll ever notice. If you ever search G-O-O-G, and then that'll come up, and that's Google. And then there's G-O-O-G-L. G-O-O-G-L is the main one to look at. And the difference is between basically voting rights. So G-O-O-G-L is what's called an A shares. And they split the stock into, this is a very, you know, uh, very nuanced company type of deal. I mean, this happens in some companies, but they sometimes will split stock. The only thing that you really need to understand is G-O-O-G-L is the A shares, and that's the one you want to trade if you can afford to trade it. Um, but that's that's important to understand because I know many of you will probably end up saying, oh, G-O-O-G, it's the same thing. Uh, there's a difference between the two, and G-O-O-G-L is the main one to trade. FB is Facebook, now known as Meta. They've changed their name. Um, I could tell you, I could go on for reasons why, but we won't today. Here is the B shares of Google, G-O-O-G. And then there's uh, NVIDIA, which is a very large uh, tech company. They make a lot of chips and probably um, chips in either the computer that you're listening to me on or your phone or whatever, but they're a very large company you should be aware of. Berkshire B. Um, so this is actually gets uh, to the thing that I was just talking about, the difference between A shares and B shares. Uh, many of you may may have heard of Warren Buffett. He is the you know main proprietor of Berkshire Hathaway, which is a company that has lasted for, for many years. And a lot of people look to them as, as somewhat of a benchmark at times on the way that they um, have run their company and the way that they choose their stocks. And there's a Berkshire A, and if you ever pulled that up, you'll see the actual price of their, their company because they've never split their stock. And so it's a very large, I haven't even looked at it in a while. It's probably two to $300,000 these days. I'm not even sure. But Berkshire B is the more affordable of the two, and they actually do the same thing. It's just, this is the B shares, this is the non-voting, but this is, if you can trade A shares, go right away. But I'm, I'm, I'm assuming probably not um, because it's very expensive. And then finally, we have JP Morgan. So these are the top 10 holdings. As you can see, it is kind of tech heavy at the top. You have Apple, which is a tech name. You have Microsoft, which is tech. Tesla is basically tech, right? I mean, they have a ton of computer chips in their car and it's basically like a computer on wheels. And then you have Google and then you have Facebook and NVIDIA, right? So it's very tech heavy. So this is the S&P 500 index. One last thing before we move on from this, I have a couple of tickers over here in the far left. You can see SPX, you can see SPY, you see IVV and VOO. These are different ways to trade the S&P 500. The important thing to understand here is that SPX is the S&P 500 index. And the difference between uh, the index and say an ETF, which is SPY, SPY is an ETF, that's an exchange traded fund. The difference between SPX and SPY is that SPY, first of all, you can actually buy and sell it. There's a bid and ask. Like we talked about earlier, bid and ask is, you know, you can actually trade those and SPY trades all day like stocks versus SPX is an index. And really there, you can't trade an index. It's a, you know, a, amalgamation of, a, of all of those 505 stocks and both of them are. But the point is that SPY trades like stocks. You can actually trade that day in and day out. There's, and so the difference is indexes and mutual funds, by the way, um, they don't trade all day like stocks do. Mutual funds, you can trade them, but you can usually trade the closing day's price, right? So you can't trade in the middle of a day and buy an, an, a mutual fund. They will give you the closing price at the end of the day. SPY is an ETF and you can trade it right now in the market. You can trade it in the morning, you can trade it in the middle of the day, you can trade it at, at, um, at you know towards the end of the day, and sometimes you can trade it in after hours trading, which might be a little bit of uh, 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 talking ahead. So that's the S&P 500 index. Next, here we have the NASDAQ. So the NASDAQ has an index, that's the NDX, right? We talked about SPX being the S&P 500 index. NASDAQ is the NDX, but it's also an ET it also has an ETF in the form of QQQ, which is Invesco QQQ. Maybe you've seen the commercials or heard about it. They've kind of made a commercial push in the last you know, year or two. Um, particularly because tech stocks have been, well, on fire. Um, there's no other way to say that than to look at the charts that are in front of you. You see that's the NASDAQ index. And you can see I have a chart of Apple uh, displayed along with it. So that kind of gives you an idea of how these two sort of run together because tech stocks, um, one thing I guess is is a good point to point out, you know, many times 
stocks within the index are going to move along with the index. They get dragged along with it, whether they you know want to or not. They kind of move in that same direction. So if I told you the Nasdaq was up you know 10% on the year, typically stocks will be up a little bit more than their index. Um, it's just because well the stocks individually are um, they're not. I don't know, how do I want to say this? An index is a lot more stable than an individual stock, right? So that's not to say Apple or Microsoft are unstable. It's just to say grouped together, they're more stable, right? It's almost like a fist, right? When you ball the fist together, it's a lot more, it's a lot harder to hurt your individual fingers. But if you have your hands out, those fingers are separated and that finger can get hurt, right? It can get bent back. It's kind of one way to put it. So the NASDAQ is definitely a lot more tech uh, heavy, as we mentioned a little bit earlier. And so if you'll notice, top 10 holdings, we have Apple again, right? We have Microsoft. We got a new ticker alert. We got Amazon, AMZN, right? Very similar to what you would think Amazon sticker would be. Um, you have Tesla, then you have Google, you have Facebook. I've taken the liberty of highlighting in yellow the names that are actually in the S&P 500 index. So you can see Google, you see in the video, you see those guys again. And then you have two newer ones at the bottom. And um, those are PayPal, which is definitely um, you know one of the newer FinTech in the past 15, 20 years, right? I mean, it's been around a long time, but it definitely has rebranded itself in a way and become more of a payment system. And then you have Adobe, right? Which has really been another company that has benefited during the pandemic as people have you know, sent all kinds of things each other to sign off and you don't have to go off in person or remember the fax machine, remember that thing? Doesn't really exist anymore, right? So these are definitely a lot more tech related. Uh, and it's just interesting to point out how similar the NASDAQ and the S&P are at the top uh, of the chain. And a lot of people have talked about how similar they are. But like we said earlier in the S&P 500, it's 28% tech. And so that's actually one of the things that has has uh, you know people complaining over the last couple of years of how these indexes are similar. It's neither here nor there, but just some talk that you understand. So you can see again, the Nasdaq is there's there's two ways to look at it. There's the NDX, which is the index, which is not necessarily not particularly tradable, right? Um, so again, we're just talking about indexes and ETFs today because those are probably the easiest to look at and eventually trade via ETFs. And so the only thing is that. Um, which I failed to mention with SPX and SPY, and you can pull this up and see them, you'll notice that SPY is one-tenth the size of SPX. So that's easy way to understand and look at and compare the two. You can understand like, oh, okay, cool. This is one-tenth the size. So this is trading, you know, 4,000 and this one's trading 400. They made it a little bit harder on us with NDX and QQQ. I honestly, I don't, know the relation i've done calculations on my own i've tried to figure it out i don't think there's any one particular calculation just understand that if the ndx is up one percent or down one percent qqq will be up one percent or down percent as well so they at least trade the same it's just the number is not um you know doesn't correspond with the number of the index for whatever reason just to make it difficult on you so that so far, we've talked about the S&P 500 index, which is a very broad-based index, which has 505 names, and it's you know it's spread out across a ton of industries. Now we've talked about NASDAQ, which is a lot more tech-focused than anything. So if you're interested in being broad-based, and that's your first thing that you want to trade, you trade the SPY, because that's very broad-based. If you want a little bit of tech exposure, then you, you know, you're going to have some already in the S&P 500, right? But if you want a little bit more, then you have QQQ to trade. That's another way to gain tech exposure. The last index we're going to talk about here is a small cap index. So IWM is the ticker. And the ticker stems from the index, which is the Russell 2000 index, which is RUT. If you, you can type that in, R-U-T, you'll see that ticker. And that's the Russell 2000. Now, the Russell 2000 and IWM both provide exposure to small public U.S. companies. Now, it should be noted that small caps tend to be riskier investments than large caps. Well, what do you mean small caps? What do you mean large caps? Well, this is where you can you know, look up the idea of market capitalization. And this is one way to break down different stocks. So you have, um, and you'll, you'll see this broken down a couple of different ways sometimes. I, I 
brought, found the most general way to, to bring it to you, but large cap companies are usually greater than 10 billion uh, in capitalization. Um, maybe you've heard about this idea of capitalization. In passing, you've seen like, oh, the idea of, you know, Apple became the first $1 trillion company and Microsoft eventually became a trillion dollar company, three trillion dollar, I don't even remember where it is now, I kind of lose, lose count. But um, capitalization is a different way to break down different stocks, right? So you have large cap stocks, which are greater than 10 billion market cap. You have mid cap stocks, which are somewhere between 10 billion and 2 billion market cap. And then you have small cap stocks, which are 2 billion market cap to 3 billion, 300 million market cap, right? And then you have lower too. I mean, there's like micro cap, you know, there's above large cap, there's mega cap, however you want to break it down. But the take home here is understanding like, okay, if I'm in a large cap company, that's usually a lot more stable because they have a lot more stable earnings there. Their, you know, a CEO structure is intact, et cetera. As you go further down, um, and, and the bigger thing about large cap is that, you know, large cap company, God, this used to be easier to say. It's not 100% true now. A large cap company is, is not gonna, you know, drop by, uh, you know, 50% or more in, in like a two week period. I mean, unless there's something really going on, but the point is large cap companies are a lot more stable. And as you go on down the line, you get to small cap companies, they can be a little more riskier as far as investments because, you know, they're growth, uh, they're, they're more growth companies, but their revenue stream might not be as, as consistent as a large cap company be, for whatever different reason, it can vary. It depends on you know the industry that they're in, right? But that's the big thing about being a small cap company is that you have greater growth potential, but it can be a little bit more risky because it's a younger probably company or their revenue stream is you know not quite as consistent as a large cap company. So with every risk, there's a reward. And with every reward, there's sometimes a risk, right? And so the greater the reward, possibly you're having a little bit more risk there, right? So these are things to consider at some point in time when you have the funds, you have the means to do it, and you are looking for a little bit more alpha, as they say in the market. When you're looking for a lot more alpha in the market, it means you're looking for a higher return on investment, but that higher return on investment can come with higher risk. And so that's something to always understand. It's the same thing in life, right? A you know higher risk can sometimes lead to a higher reward, but you have to make sure that higher risk doesn't put you in a situation where you lose everything. That's the important take home. So IWM is an ETF where you can trade small cap stocks and it gives you exposure to small cap stocks. And that's one of the reasons why people trade it. And I do have to tell you, these stock charts have changed a bit in the last three weeks <laughs> since we put these slides together because IWM currently is trading at a discount to what you see on the screen. But that's as a result of the current worries in the market. The idea, the, one of the reasons why this is trading lower is because right now people are a little more nervous about the growth potential um, for the United States as we go forward a couple of years out. Whereas there's theoretically, we're probably going to raise uh, base interest rates because of the type of inflation that you've probably been hearing about in the market day in and day out, and not just in the market, in our economy. And so that's why stocks are beginning to come back and fall down, trade as a discount. That's why, you know, the same thing we've heard with other risk assets, uh, cryptocurrencies, but nevertheless, understand that if you want exposure to a broad-based index, you have the SPY, which is an ETF. You can trade the S&P 500. If you want a little uh, exposure to more tech than anything, you have the NASDAQ in the form of the QQQ ETF, where you can trade tech stocks. If you want exposure to small cap companies, you have this IWM ETF, which gives you exposure to small cap stocks and their potential growth throughout time. And so you'll see these in a myriad of ways. You'll see them even when you look at your 401ks and they give you options. Literally, all I ever look for is what's tracking the S&P 500, what's tracking tech stocks, what's tracking small caps, right? And, you know, from there, sometimes we'll, people will look for overseas stuff and, you know, th those are those are fine, too. But these are your three bases as far as the U.S. stock market that are th things that you want to look for. The S&P 500, tech stocks, small caps. One last thing I want to fill you in on that you'll probably have if you've heard of um, before, maybe not. or Maybe you're hearing about it recently. <clears throat> this can get really complicated, but I'm going to keep it very simple. There are volatility indexes, 
that track the volatility of the market. And by volatility of the market, I mean how much, how many, what kind of swings that are happening in the market on a day-to-day -day basis. And we're getting some swings right now. If you'll look, I mean, you definitely, if you're starting or you've heard about some stuff, you definitely heard about a swing yesterday because there was a big swing in the market yesterday. The market, um, most of these three indices went from being down two to 3% to ending the day up one to 2%, which is, well, not 2%, but I think maybe close to 1%, which is rare. I mean, that just doesn't really happen. And volatility is kind of a measure of how um, you know, how much, what kind of swings that we're getting in the market back and forth. And when I say swings, I mean up and down. And one good way to look at that and get a measure of that is called the volatility index. It's the ticker VIX, V-I-X. Um, it is an index, just like we talked about the SPX, in that it's not tradable. So you can't buy the VIX stock. It's not such a, it's not, it's not a thing. It's a forward-looking measure of how volatile the S&P index is expected to be over the next 30 days. I would recommend, now I don't want to recommend anything. <laughs> what I would, I would like it, it would be nice if you do not trade these ETFs that I'm mentioning because you are still too new in the game and you need to understand how these things trade. This VIX index eventually has spawned many volatility-related ETFs. And so if you're catching on to the game now, you understand that they'll usually create an index and then they'll usually create ETFs for people to be able to trade them because that's the easiest way to trade them. Two of them are for the volatility index. There's one called VXX and there's one called UVXY. And if you've never heard of these, then please do not go out and trade them <laughs> because they are, they are not investable. They are not, um, because the reason why I say that, if you look at the chart, you'll see exactly what I mean. These eventually tend to trade uh, in the, they eventually lead to negative returns. So it's not necessarily something that you want to invest in. It's not something where you're like, okay, I have some volatility in my portfolio, I'm good now. It's a, these are very hard to understand instruments and you should learn more about them before you ever even decide to trade them. But the reason I'm bringing it to you is the VIX can be used as a method of determining the current risk or anxiety level in the market. It's often called the fear gauge. And so one way you can look at this, and this is a uh, what we have in front of you is about a 10 year chart, a little more of the VIX index. A On average, over the past 20 plus years, the average VIX is a 19. And so if you drew a line at say 20, you can see all the times that we're very high above and more than likely, you know those times. Um, you can see, of course, the where it hit 80, that was during the pandemic. And that shows you the kind of strife and the worry that was going on in the market. You can see at the beginning of 2018, that's when we were having issues with the US-China trade war. And there was a lot going on with tariffs between us and China. You can see it in 2015, it hit 40 and that was because of what uh, different things that were going on in China at the time. They devaluated their yuan currency. And of course, when somebody changes their currency, it affects all currencies across the world. And that created angst in the market. And uh, so there's plenty of times in throughout history where this thing has risen well above that 19 average. And that's one way to measure it. And so we're above that 19 average right now. And usually people look at that as a time to get invest a little bit more in stocks, right? And so uh, what I want you to understand is when somebody says to you, oh, the VIX is above 30, you're like, oh, wow, that's, you can say to them, that's well above the long-term average of 19. Stocks must be down right now, and maybe it's a decent time to buy. But again, you should always only buy with the amount of money that you can afford, and you should never go 100% into the market. Hopefully, we're clear on that. So that's all I got, guys. I went a little bit over time. That's my time. Um, you know, I want you guys to understand Having market awareness is one of the most important skills you can learn at the start of trading. Begin with watch lists. Create a watch list of plenty of stocks, put them in it, and keep an eye on them from day to day. Watch how they move and eventually determine, you know, if you don't believe me, take a look at how they move along with those indexes and see if that index is up positive 1%. How much is my particular stock up today? Depends. You know, news varies. Sometimes stocks aren't necessarily up double the index, but percentage wise, but they do move. It should be in a positive direction unless it has some stock specific news. Stocks versus ETFs versus index, understand the difference between those instruments and learning how to use them can lead to less frustration. And then finally, interpreting volatility. Volatility indexes are derived from the movement 
of those indexes at which they track. In this case, when I'm talking about the VIX, that's derived from the different movement in up or down direction of the S&P 500. But they can give you clues to market mag the magnitude of market stress and how worried people are right now when it comes to the market. But again, you can always be a little bit worried that you're losing money, but just make sure you're not 100% in the market. And that leaves you a lot less worried. I can promise you that. So um, that's my time. Again, I'm Jamal Chandler. I do have a show on the Taste Trade Network called Engineering the Trade. It is largely option based. When you get to that point, you want to understand more, come and watch us, man. It's uh, from 1.30 to 2.30, uh, 1.30 to 2 Central Time or 2.30 to 3 Eastern Time. And it's on the Taste Trade Network. I'm actually working on getting it on YouTube soon as well. So that's enough talking for me, Todd. Sorry I ran over a little bit, but uh, that's it. Oh, you that was excellent, Jermall. I want to thank you so much for that because you went over some incredible basics that I think a lot of folks really, uh, and there were some great questions uh, as we went as well, uh, so that you know pe people understand the concept of how you can access the the market uh, through these different indexes. And what I also want to mention is at the end of the day, we are going to be going through. Nadex products to access these uh, these these markets where you can access uh, price action in the Dow, the S and P, the Nasdaq, the Russell, other global equity indices, and you can do so in a very defined risk environment using knockouts, call spreads, and binary options. So we do have that at the end of the day, another way to access price action in these markets.